I speak of former Immigration Minister and Housing Secretary Robert Jenrick, who of course is one of the five that now go on to do battle. Thanks for coming in, Mr Jenrick. Good morning. I, I will Very say congratulations. You, you won the first round. Long well, there's way a, there's to, a long way to go. A long way to go. Well, it is literally a long way to go. We're all going up to the conference, I think, aren't we? Um, what, was it, what was it in your offering that you think worked to the, mem- to the, uh, to the MPs and then will work to the members? Well, look, as you say, it is a long way to go. Uh, I'm pleased to have the support of colleagues in Parliament from all wings of the party. But what I'm going to do is continue to make the case that I've begun, which is to say that we should, of course, fiercely defend the things that we got right in office, like reforms of our schools, the public finances that we left in far better condition than we found them. But we have to be painfully honest about the things that we got wrong, whether that's on the economy, where growth was too low and taxes were too high, and we have to have a better route to grow our economy faster, whether it's on the NHS, where there are too many people on NHS waiting lists and we didn't do enough to tackle the productivity challenges there, or indeed on migration, where we said we would control and reduce immigration, we would secure our borders, and whilst we made some progress, we didn't do enough. So I'm setting out a case as to how we need to listen and learn from the mistakes that we've made, unite around some serious answers to the big challenges that undoubtedly the country faces right now, and above all to hold Labour to account for the mistakes that they're making already in just the first eight weeks. Why did the previous government fail to to stop the boats, to use the words of the former PM? Well, as you know, I resigned from the Cabinet at the end of last year, and I fought relentlessly for a stronger policy. I secured big changes to our legal migration system that are already starting to bear fruit. We're seeing uh, about a 300,000 person a year reduction in the numbers coming into the country. But I didn't believe that was enough. I felt that the decisions that have been made before my time, immediately after the 2019 election, were wrong. They were almost like sticking two fingers up to the public who had voted for a controlled and reduced migration system. And we need to go further. What I've advocated for is a legally binding cap in the tens of thousands, so we bring the numbers right down. And by doing so, we relieve pressure on housing, on public services, and we make ourselves a more united country. On illegal migration... Yes, how would that stop the boats? My position was very clear. I argued to the Prime Minister at the time that we need a policy whereby if someone arrives here on a small boat, they're detained immediately, they're removed either back home, if it's a safe place like Albania, and I signed the deal with Albania, or to a safe third country like Rwanda. And in order to make that policy... You're still a supporter of the Rwanda I am. In order to make that policy work, I've come to the view that we need to leave the European Convention on Human Rights so that it's British courts and our judges who are ultimately in the driving seat and Parliament can bring forward laws which secure our borders, which I think is the first duty of the British state. But I understood the United Kingdom was one of the architects of that European Convention. Why would we turn our back on something that... Hopefully we played a major role in putting together. Well, we did. And I think the British jurists and Winston Churchill, who uh, created that at the aftermath of the Second World War, would be aghast at what it's become today. Because we have foreign national offenders like murderers and rapists and paedophiles who we can't remove from the country because of that human rights architecture. We've got terror suspects on our streets who we can't survey properly or remove because of it. And we're not able to properly secure our border in an age when there are millions of people looking to come to developed economies like ours. So I don't come at this from an ideological perspective. I come at it from a practical one. And I I want to replace it with a British Bill of Rights that would secure our human rights, protect minorities, protect freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all the things that we care about, the, the things that we really gave the world as a country. So our rights would be enhanced, but they would be brought home and it'd be British Parliament, and our British judges that were in the driving seat. Lastly, on the Rwanda scheme, how do you react to the news that uh, now the German government is exploring the possibility? I don't want to overrake this, Mm. but they are possibly looking at picking up the remnants of what the UK government tried to put together, Mr Jenry. Well, I think it's a farce. It is a total farce that just as our friends and allies around the world, like the Germans, are considering schemes akin to the one that we had with Rwanda, our own government has scrapped it. And they've essentially surrendered to the people smuggling gangs because they now have no plan whatsoever. Well, they're holding a summit today, Mr Jenrick, where they say they will, quote, smash the gangs. They would probably challenge you on that. Well, I think that they're either being dishonest or hopelessly naive. All of the people they will meet today at this summit, like the National Crime Agency, I've met and worked with for years. And they said to me, as I'm sure they will say to Yvette Cooper today, that whilst it is important to do law enforcement and diplomacy, I did all those things. And many of the things they're trumpeting today 
uh, like seizure of boats in Bulgaria, or things that I put in place. It isn't enough. You have to have a deterrent. You have to break the people smuggling gangs by making it clear to people who are in a place of safety like France that if they come here illegally, they'll never find a life here in the United Kingdom. Without that, we'll never get out of this issue. And the cycle of broken promises, the, the public mistrust over this issue will just be perpetuated. This is very tough talking. Some colleagues have suggested you were even radicalised during your time in the Home Office as immigration minister. Do you recognise that? Well, it's certainly true that my experience of the Home Office... Uh, led me to some pretty firm conclusions. I think that mass migration is not working in our country. It's making it harder for young people to get a home. It's making it difficult for people to get on their, you know, a doctor's appointment, a dentist appointment. And it is leading in some places to divided communities. I want to build a united country. And that's not going to happen when you have 1.2 million people coming into our country every year. Well, and, where are those divided communities, Mr. Jenry? Well, I think there are pockets of communities in some of our major cities where people are living parallel lives. And that is not the country which I want to see my children and grandchildren growing up. And I want people to be living side by side for there to be a sense of national togetherness. And that does mean taking action to build more united communities and above all to stop the very large numbers of people coming into the country that we've seen in recent so years. Because it's well, just not practical no, to but integrate people at the pace we've seen in recent decades. So are we talking about some of these great northern cities such as Bradford and Blackburn and cities such as that? Where are we actually talking about? Well, in, in recent years, we have seen intercommunal tensions, for example, in Leicester, right. in London. Uh, we saw just the other day in Birmingham that there were retaliatory um, protests or riots uh, by sectarian gangs as a result of or in line with the far right activity that we'd seen at the I same see. time. And that's wrong. I, I want us to be calling out that kind of action wherever it comes from, whether it's the disgraceful actions of the far right or these sectarian gangs. And a part of the explanation is that we are too divided now as a country. OK, look, coming to the last minute or so together, just reminding my listeners, you also served, not where you in the Home Office, you were also Secretary of State for Housing. So part of the aftermath of Grenfell came on your watch. You'll be aware of numbers far better than I, Mr Jenrick. There are still too many properties in this country that have this cladding. Some of them aren't even getting anywhere close to remove the cladding. Did you do enough in that field? Well, I worked very hard on this issue, and it was one I cared a great deal about, and I secured from the then Chancellor, uh, later Prime Minister, uh, over £3 billion of funding to help those people who were trapped in buildings with dangerous cladding to begin the process of getting it off their, their properties, and so that they could, first of all, live safely. Yes, and, but seven uh, years on, confidence. there are still cladding But it's buildings. still taking far too long. But and why is that? I think it's, it's a highly complex issue. There are thousands of buildings, yes. some of whom where the leaseholders simply didn't even know what the cladding was on their building. And local government, government, and above all, the freeholders of some of these buildings have been far too slow to act. It, we need to work harder. I spoke in the statement that the Prime Minister did on the Grenfell report uh, during the week and offered my support and the, the, the leader of the opposition did of the opposition to help the government in anything that it does in the months ahead to speed up this process. But could you have done more, lastly? You, you were running the housing department, as it were, the housing ministry, and people were still, I don't want to overdo this, but probably going to bed very anxious at night. Of course. Look, I don't, I don't want to diminish that because I know that there were and there are today thousands of people in our country who are deeply concerned Indeed. about the, the homes that they live in, that they're bringing up their children in. What I did was to secure the billions of pounds of public money that was necessary to begin this process. And uh, no housing secretary since ha has, has done more in that respect. But there's a lot more to be done in this. I, I think that this is going to be a challenge that will take, unfortunately, many years to resolve. Lastly, uh, you're closer to this, but tell my listeners, what's the timeline now for the work? What happens? Presumably you could do it all again soon, do you, Mr Jenry? It goes on. Uh, there's a vote on Tuesday right. where another one of the candidates uh, will be uh, eliminated. It's like an Agatha Christie it, drama. It, it's a little it? like that. Uh, then we go to Birmingham where I suspect you'll, yes, you'll be I'll there be and we're going to have uh, us all giving speeches. I hope that we can do you know, uh, a big speech. We can try to uh, impress, set out our vision, more importantly, for, for the country and for the party. 
And then there'll be a further vote of members of parliament. And then ultimately the members of the Conservative Party will make a decision and the new leader will be announced at the beginning of November. I sense we'll be speaking again. Thank you for coming to the Thank studios. Thank you. It's a Conservative pleasure. leadership candidate Robert Jenrick appearing here on LBC.